17. Alexander forgot his grief by attacking a hostile tribe called the Cathayi. These people were under the influence of a priestly class called the Brahmins, who were known both for their wisdom and their pride. Alexander's informants told him that these Brahmins had been fomenting resistance to the unclean Macedonians up and down the Indus Valley. The king was therefore keen to confront this enemy head-on. Hephaestion took it upon himself to go to attack Sela, to observe the Brahmins there. When he returned, he reported that they lived together in the woods like wild animals. The young ones went out completely naked, letting their hair grow long. At the age of thirty-seven, they were allowed to shave their heads and wear linen robes. Despite their poverty, the Brahmins were held in highest esteem by the people, for only they were permitted to make prayers, conduct sacrifices, or entreat the gods in any way. For this reason, they had no need of material wealth. If they became hungry, they went to the markets and received supplies from the merchants without needing to ask. But because the Brahmins believed it polluting for anyone of a lesser class to touch their food, their meals could only be prepared by other Brahmins. Similarly, when the unguent sellers saw one of these sages in the marketplace, they would do them conspicuous honor by covering them with expensive oils. To go about so anointed, therefore, became something of a badge of a Brahmin virtue. Hephaestion approached a beautiful young Brahmin who was standing by a stream. His hair was divided into two quays, one draped over each shoulder, and his skin was shining with oil, as I have described. The young man was standing on one foot, arms outstretched, with logs two feet long in each hand. He kept this excruciating position, staring straight ahead, never wavering, for the entire time Hephaestion watched him. As he did so, an older Brahmin approached to ask about the philosophy of the Greeks. Hephaestion obliged by telling him something of the teachings of Pythagoras, Socrates, and Diogenes. You Greeks have some wisdom, the old Brahmin finally said, but all in all you concern yourselves too much with politics. There's nothing less worth the time of a mature mind than the ways men contrive their social relations. It surprises me to learn that, replied Hephaestion, because it is said that you Brahmins advise your kings on all matters of state. The wise man must raise his children, but does not confine his thinking to childish questions. Would you like to learn the proper objects of serious thought? Good. First, take off your clothes. Hephaestion declined. Then let that be your first lesson. If you cannot put off your clothes, you cannot lay aside the more profound burdens. Remember what I have told you. With that, the old Brahmin walked away. The young one was still holding up his logs. As Hephaestion was conversing with the elder, he had slowly switched from standing on the left leg to the right, but had otherwise stayed motionless. The capital of the Cathayi, Sangala, stood twenty parasangs beyond the river Assassines. The natives defended the place with a triple line of wagons 
around the town. Although the Macedonians had the advantage of massive numbers, the Cathai retreated in good order as their enemies took each line of defense. At length, after many casualties on both sides, the Cathai were shut up inside the walls, facing the unpleasant prospect of assault by Alexander's siege engines. Thousands of enemy fighters tried to sneak out of Sangala during the night. Python was waiting for them. The prisoners were then given a choice, execution or a place among Alexander's auxiliaries. They all chose the latter, but it seemed a peculiarity of the men of Asia that such promises were taken lightly. The following night all of them tried to escape yet again. This time the Macedonians showed no mercy. By the time the work was done, they had hacked to death more than 7,000 of the deserters. Another 10,000 were killed in the siege. Upon seeing all these bodies littering the ground, I could not restrain myself from reproving, from a reproving look at Alexander. To my surprise, he tossed his head with a smile. Don't worry, Macan. I shall be gone soon enough. The king ordered Python to spare ten Brahmins from the general slaughter. Knowing their reputation for virtue and still assuming they belonged to a kind of Asiatic school of sophists, Alexander had these specimens brought before him. It was his intention to host a debate and perhaps in this way revive the spirit of inquiry that had steadily been snuffed out by the brutality of the war. But he was destined to be disappointed. When he posed a series of philosophical puzzles to them, believing he might learn how they think, none of the prisoners answered. On pain of death, he repeated his questions. Which are more numerous, those now alive or those who have died? Where do more creatures live, in the ocean or on the land? Which came first, day or night? How shall a man make others love him? Yet even under the most dire threats, the Brahmins stayed silent. In this way, Alexander learned that they were not sages at all, but a class of haughty nobles who needed to learn humility. I had asked once for you to speak, he said. A god does not ask twice. The penalty was severe for their silence. Alexander had their mouths sewn shut. The Brahmins were then left to languish in full view of the camp. For the most part, they did so bravely, except for three who somehow managed to drink through their noses. These were killed as the army decamped to cross the next river to their east, the Hyphasis. This was another muddy, roiling torrent that was bigger than any river in Greece. Faced with the prospect of another laborious crossing and the need to cross it again on the way home, a change abruptly came over the hearts of the rank-and-file soldiers where before everyone simply went along with the rest of the mass. It suddenly became thinkable to demand an end to the misery. In the tents, around the cook fires and the latrines, the talk was quite open about it. Their immediate superiors, moreover, stopped punishing such a chatter. Alexander's position on this was far less clear than Askenes represents. Idle curiosity to see what lay on the other side of the next hill was part of his nature, to be sure. The prospect of returning to Babylon to become a more, a mere administrator, or worse yet, to Pella an inevitable assassination, held little attraction. Better to die in battle, spear leveled against the elephants of the great king of India. But on the other hand, without Eridaeus, or Pemenium, the prospect of victory against superior forces was remote. 
As resigned to death as Alexander was, he still preferred to die as the victor than as the vanquished. Nor was he blind to the suffering of his men. You have heard the prosecution relate the substance of a speech the king gave on the shores of the Hyphysis. In this speech, Alexander is supposed to have argued for a continuation of the war to the farthest shores of Asia. When this wish was defied by his men, he rallied against the cowards around him and stripped off his clothes to show his scars. Then he supposedly retreated to his tent to sulk like Achilles. That speech did occur. What my opponent misses, though, is everything the speaker really meant. The simple-minded heroism of Askenazy's version serves the purposes of Ptolemy and Antipater to burnish the legend of the god-hero who assures their authority. The real story is a great deal more interesting. It was the subtlest speak Alexander ever produced. For at the same time, he had to encourage his men to fight on, but also to make sure that his appeal was denied. And once it was denied, he had to convince everyone that he was disappointed. It was a short, shrewd performance from a man more used to giving orders than working persuasion. He gathered his officers, irrespective of rank, in the field outside the camp, just as the setting sun broke through under the storm clouds. He mounted a wagon and raised his hands for quiet. The late sunshine cast a golden light on him that made him seem like his own commemorative bronze. My friends, I have been knocked about a fair amount these last years. My ears have rung as much as yours, but rest assured, I am not deaf yet. It comes to my attention that some of you want to go home, and I must say I understand, for we now know why there are so many big rivers in India. Zeus never stops the rain. It was a well-timed joke, but drew only grimaces. Rain in India is not a laughing matter. It is still only a short time since we met the Polravas in battle. We fought that morning as the superior force, overmatching our enemy in men and horses and, in the end, in valor. Even so, a thousand of our companions will not see home after that test. A thousand more have claimed their rest in the time since it of wounds and sickness. You are wrong if you believe I have not noticed these losses. Now we march toward the lands of the great king of India, whose domains encompass the balance of Asia. I have been as immersed in rumors of what we will find there as I have been in this field fetid air. And I must say, they are just as unhealthy. So if you want to know what you will find at the Ganges, don't ask your tent mate. Ask me. Go ahead. Ask. There was a pause before the officers took his invitation. What will we find, O King? they cried. Death, Alexander said and victory. Exactly what you found everywhere else. For have we not learned that the butt of a sword feels the same in every land? Or its edge, for that matter? Whence this morbid curiosity, my friends? Have we not found the same reward everywhere? Death to some, victory for the rest, then another river to cross? Comrades deserve the truth from comrades. From me to you, from me you should expect no fairy tales, no rosy scenarios. To civilize the world is hard work. But here's another dose of honesty, boys. I won't go on without you. I've got mere 
I've got more a treasure than Cronia. Sorry. I've got more treasure than Croesus, and I could hire ten times your number in mercenaries. But I won't. We've come this far together, and on the strength of your loyalty, this campaign will live or die. I want to go east. Some of you want to go home. The job only half done. Some say, leave something of the world for our sons to conquer. I say, leave our sons a world at peace, under the rule of a king who knows how much you bled to win it. You all have misgivings, I know. You have questions I haven't begun to answer. Where does Asia end? Are the elephants in India twice as large as those of Porus? Will we all stray so far from home that we will return more barbarian than Greek? Of these matters, I can only tell you, I don't know yet. But I want us to find the answers together. I await your reply. As you recall, the response came from Coenus, son of Polemocrates. This man was a competent infantry commander. His role in defeating Spitamines and pressing the Indians at the Hydaspes were decisive, but as an orator, his talents were decidedly modest. I was there when delivered his rambling argument for withdrawal, and it was a wonder how it has been built up into the tearjerker it has been by Ptolemy and his followers. But the reason is simple enough given that Alexander's professed wish to go on was defied. Only a brilliant oration would motivate the retreat without diminishing the king. Coming forward, Coenus said, I address you reluctantly, as the humble must naturally be in the face of the Lord of all Asia. For who would dispute that you already bear that title, a now ruling lands greater in extent than the great king himself. My king, hear the words of a man who has been with you since before the Granicus. Hear one who was there before the Hellespont, the Danube, or Thebes. Hear one who first rode during the first campaign against the Tribalians, and yes, who shed his share of tears at the funeral of your father. For eight years you have led, and we have followed. We have been privileged to do so, for it is ever a blessing to serve in the company of greatness. Let none of us here forget who we were but a generation ago, when we fled to the hills at the mere sight of Illyrians and Thracians, and were the butt of jokes from fancy city dwellers from the south. Now the primitives fear us, and the cities compete to flatter us. You have shown us what men are capable of when their honor is awakened. For that, for your wisdom and leadership, we are ever in your debt. Today we count on that wisdom again. You see us standing before you, and you must know that there are no gods here. Men stand here broken, their every step made in agony by wounds that won't heal in this infernal heat. They stand here naked, or in the garb of barbarians, for they have gone beyond the limits of resupply from home. And they stand here dispirited, for all of them have wives they can barely recall, and children they scarcely know. O oh, king, remember your beloved Bucephalus, who rests now among those hills beside us. 
even he, your most faithful companion, was allowed to find his stall at last. All of us witnessed the tenderness with which you handled him in his final months. And yet, do not your men deserve the compassion you displayed to your horse? Like him, there are limits to how far and how hard an army may be ridden. On this, I don't pretend to tell you what you must already know. Our plea is not made in contempt of your ambitions, not at all. We advance your plan, because the conquest of India is a job we leave to the next generation. Your next army already awaits you at home. It tends flocks on the plains of Emathia. It waters its cattle in the swift, sweet Axios. With wooden swords it drills in earnest, fondly imagining the celebration that will attend the return of divine Alexander, so long absent from the land of his countrymen. And that youthful army yearns to live, and that youthful army yearns to give you India, Africa, Europe. We, who have shared some modest part of your glory, beg you not to deprive our sons of this privilege. Please know that I say nothing of hubris or pride or any of the sins whispered by those who take a darker view. Personally, I don't believe such talk. I know that a mind so keen on the timing of things, when to encamp, march, or attack, can also know when it's time to stop. Wisdom knows when to push away from the table to retire for the night. In truth, even the gods must take account of fortune, and the bitter way she may turn on even the most successful, so much more so than mere mortals like us. And that is all I have to say. As it was, many were surprised that Alexander perceived his case so devastated by Coenus's argument. What really happened, I suspect, was that after the king pretended to have been defeated in the debate, weeping and rending his clothes, he went back to his tent and enjoyed a three-day bender. Then he came out and made the concession he intended all along. The army would turn south to the sea, and after that, march for home. Coenus was as desperate in his sincerity as Alexander was not. Believing himself to have defied a god, his anguish drove him to illness. Immediately after the king left, he could not breathe. Within a day, he was bedridden, unable to eat or sleep. Some suspected he had been poisoned for opposing Alexander. But as I have said, Alexander only pretended to oppose withdrawal. Coenus was only thirty-six when they put him on the pyre. Indeed, Ptolemy, Perdiccas, and Craterus had better grounds than Alexander for wishing Coenus had kept his mouth shut. Though they never communicated their preferences to me, not in any overt way, it would have better served their purpose for the king to have found a gallant death in battle. Afterward, they could lead the beleaguered Macedonians on an epic retreat, like Chrysophis leading the ten thousand dispos of the ailing Aridaeus, and divide the empire between them. Of course, I can offer no evidence that my story should be preferred over Ascanese's. No evidence at all, except the minor fact that I spent more than a decade observing the characters of these men, and Ascanese was not there at all. I will not hide my own preference from you on this question. I supported an Indian campaign. 
For as I watched the king change over the months and years, I came to believe that if he survived to see his old domains again, he would not rule them the same enlightened way. For the sake of his life, I helped convince him of his divinity, but at the cost of making him half mad with godly demands. He now expected not only his subordinates to grovel before him, but kings and chiefs. How much more a tyrant would he have become if emissaries from all the Greek cities came to him with all manner of gross flatteries? Would the free men of Athens be obliged to prostrate themselves at the feet of the universal conqueror? The thought revolted me. If I indict myself with this admission, so be it. One way or another, Alexander was bound to be assassinated, like every other Macedonian king in his line. Better that he find his reward in far India fighting in the manner that he loved, than have his reign collapse on our heads here.